Perfect. Thank you everyone for attending in person and online. So this week we have uh, a talk from Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester on the nose. So we hope that you've brought along a little snack and I'll hand over to Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Sorry I'm not there with you. Uh, normally my talk, this talk involves quite a bit of interactivity. So I'd be getting you smelling things, getting people up onto the stage. Uh, that wasn't possible uh, this time, but maybe another time. But I do hope that you've brought along something small and, and tasty. So I've got a skittle, um, but jelly beans would be good. I mean, I think the donuts you've just been snarfing are probably going to be a bit big, um, but something small and tasty, but don't do anything with it until I tell you. OK, so I'm going to be talking uh, about how our sense of smell works, not only in us, but also in maggots and in Neanderthals. So this is going to be a summary of our knowledge or lack thereof about how the sense of smell works. And also giving you some insight into how we can find out more and why we want to be, might want to be interested, say, in how a maggot smells. So noses, I mean, if, again, if this was an interactive thing, I get you all yelling out what these noses are. What's this animal? Uh, do you know that? Sometimes people know this. This is a star-nosed mole. It's obviously a bat. This, it's, uh, I think it's a moray eel, but it might be a conger. I'm not very good on eels. That's obviously an elephant. Um, right, well, that's a dog. And that's a cat. And now we get into the tricky ones. What's this? Well, I can tell you what sex it is. It's from a male. It is, in fact, a male moth antenna. Now we've got two down here. Um, any ideas? Does anybody know? Talk to your neighbour. Uh, right, well, this one is a, an ant antenna, and this is from a male cockchafer, which is kind of a beetle. And as to this, it's not a walrus, and I'll explain that later on. So there are lots of noses in the animal kingdom, which are all doing the same thing. They are trying to capture chemical signals in the outside world. And the sense of smell is the oldest sense that we have. So the very earliest organisms have all been able to detect chemical gradients. Bacteria can move up and down chemical gradients, for example. So although the actual mechanisms are very different in different classes of organism, it is the oldest sense that we have. Before being able to detect gravity or light, organisms were and still are uh, detecting chemical signals in the environment. So it's been around for billions of years. And the reasons why animals in particular might want, to, might want to smell are kind of varied, fairly obviously. You might want to find food. You might want to remember something. So this is something that you might not, well, when I say it, you probably think, yeah, that's true. So for example, Vimto, which is a delightful, delightful beverage to be found in the north of England and also in the Middle East. It's very, very sweet and kind of tastes of grapes. Um, and this, when I was a kid, I used to drink lots of this and you have it hot. And if I smell Vimto now, it takes me back to the Stockport baths where I'll go for a swim and then have hot Vimto and Golden Wonder cheese and onion flavor crisps. So what happens when you smell something is that part of the signal, this is true in you or in any animal with a brain, is that the uh, smell goes in two places. One, you're identifying exactly what it is. Secondly, part of the signal is shunted into your, what, into your memory banks as you are con continually observing the world. And that means that later on, you can actually recall those memories by the smell. So just as when I smell Vimto, I'm back there, kind of seven years old in Stockport Bass, you'll have a smell that will take you back into your past. And it's not just remembering it, but you are, you know, you, I don't know, you smell your grandmother's baking and then you are again, you know, kind of uh, three foot high, sitting, standing up around her, trying to look at what she's doing uh, in the kitchen. So the memory, the power of smell to evoke memory is extremely significant. You might also, of course, want it to uh, use it to mate, to have chemical signals, they're called pheromones, that males and females give out. So here we've got a pair of crane flies, daddy long legs, if you prefer. Sadly, we don't get them as bright as this in the, in the UK, this from the USA. And you can immediately tell which one's the male. Okay, 
So look at her, these antennae, tiny little things. All this individual is going to do is to find a place to oviposit because this is the female and the male has got his huge, great big antennae, which means that he can detect her chemical signals from very, very far off. So when you see a pair of animals and one has very ornate structures uh, in its olfactory region, it's almost certainly going to be the male. And these are pheromones, which attract, uh, attract mates. So here's a male moth, and if you, we're looking at him head on, right? So here's his head, you can see here his eye, the other eye, and this huge antenna, absolutely massive. And you can see that his structure, they're kind of bent round, and on there are thousands and thousands of hairs, and on those hairs there are cells that can have millions and millions of olfactory receptor molecules which can detect the pheromone, they are tuned just to detect that particular odor. And moths can, male moths can detect females from miles away. These smells can waft over uh, the air. And I'm going to show you here's a, an example. So we've got some silk, whoops, let's go back. We've got a silkworm, we've got some silkworms, and we've got a fan here. And you can't quite see it, but you will in a minute. There's a, a, a petri dish here, upside down petri dish with a female underneath it. And here are the males, and you're gonna see these gentlemen are all rather portly. Uh, and this is because obviously we've been breeding silkworms for thousands of years uh, to get their silk from their cocoons. And all we're really interested in is having a whopping great big moth. So we've ended up with really, really very large moths that eat far too many mulberry leaves and they can't actually fly anymore. Um, anyway, what you're gonna see, there's a fan here, and a hand is, as you just saw, is going to come over and lift up the uh, top of the petri dish, blow the air that way, and then let's watch what the males do. Here we go. Here's the hand, lifts up the lid, blowing the air, and immediately you can see that the males here all start fluttering. As I said, they they can't fly. They're whew, they got to <laughs> they're doing their best to run. And who's going to win? Who's going to get to the female first? Is it going to be him? Is he going to get there? Is he going to, oh, is he going to sneak in? No, he doesn't quite make it. So there you go. This, this character here lost the race to reproduce and uh, this one succeeded. So pheromones are incredibly powerful. You might also want to use your smells to identify where your home is and social insects in particular will use uh, smells to be able to identify where their home is or to mark your territory which is what dogs do in ways we still don't really understand. The chemicals in their urine uh, enable them to identify not only the sex, uh, the reproductive status of an individual, but clearly their identity. And when they have a good sniff at the base of a tree, they know who's been there. They know if they recognize or not the individual who has urinated there. And you might also be able to detect danger. So smoke is one of the most powerful things that we can smell. It will wake you up. It will kick in uh, your brain stem if you smell smoke at night and wake you up immediately. And this is a common feature all across the animal kingdom because fire is a natural hazard. Terrible things happen, except with one exception. So there is a beetle which lays its eggs into freshly burnt wood, into charcoal, and it will fly towards the smoke because it's after the smell that it wants to attract it to the smell so it can find the charcoal to lay its eggs. And the final reason why you might want to smell, if you're a human anyway, is to be able to taste. Now, pre-pandemic, everybody thought this was bonkers. People are a bit more convinced that there's a link now because you taste with your nose, not entirely, but pretty much. Most of the interesting things that you taste, you are tasting through smell. And those of you who've had COVID and lost your sense of smell will know that you also tended to lose your sense of taste. And both those are now seen as one of the key symptoms of COVID. And this is where your little sweets or whatever you've got with you come in handy. So we've got here, I've got my, uh, my skittle. I've got jelly beans in the picture, that doesn't matter. So what I want you to do is to get what you've got in your hand, your sweet or whatever it is. If you haven't got one, never mind. Just imagine, you won't be able to imagine because it's really quite, when it works, it's great. And you're gonna hold your nose. And then when I tell you, you're going to eat the sweet or whatever it is with your nose still held like that. And you're gonna chew for a little while and see whether you can tell what taste it is, okay? And then when I tell you, only when I tell you, you take your fingers off your nose and we should see something. Okay, right, we ready? 
Everybody, everybody in the lecture theatre ready? You people out in internet land, you're ready. Got your sweet. Hold your nose like this. Get your sweet. Fruit in your mouth. Chew. And you'll probably find it tastes vaguely sweet. Maybe not even that. Now, take your fingers off. Mmm. Mine was lemon. What was yours? So, you can see very, very clear. The problem is when I do this, I now get bits of uh, skittle bunking up my uh, teeth for hours. So you can see that your sense of smell is producing something much richer than the basic taste modalities you had when you initially started chewing it. And that's because what happens when you chew, when you smell rather, is your smells, here we've got a, a cutaway. You're not, you may think I'm smelling up here or even, you know, that bit of your nose just about here where you start shoving the, the sampler up. No, 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 you're, sam you're smelling way up here at eye level. That's where the action is. That's where it's actually taking place. It's not here, it's not there, it's up here. Right, uh, at the base of your brain, there's part of your uh, olfactory bulb dangles down. This is part of your brain that is actually in contact with the outside world. The neurons dangle down into the, uh, the top of your sinuses and they come into contact with the air. And that is how you smell. So what's just happened? when we've done that, if, if it worked at all, is you've, you've blocked off your nose, you've been chewing down here, and the smells have gone up into the volatiles from your sweet or whatever you've been eating, have gone up into this area, but they can't get up to the olfactory bowl because you blocked off your nose. So you build up pressure, take your uh, fingers off your nose, whoosh, you get that sudden rush of odor going over your olfactory epithelium, and immediately you can identify what flavor it is. And the whole what it's showing is that flavor and taste are very different thing. Taste is basically salt, sweet, sour, acid, uh, kind of proteiny stuff, uh, and that's about it. Whereas flavor has got a whole infinite range of different modalities, all of which are coming from your sense of smell. So your sense of smell is incredibly significant for uh, taste. And as I said, and many of you will know, if you lose your sense of smell, that plays merry hell with your ability to taste things. So you're smelling, you're tasting with your nose, but you're smelling with your brain. Okay, and I've just kind of shown you that. So now normally I'd ask you to, again, we have a kind of shout out thing. So here we've got a, a dog uh, and a human. And who do you think's got a, a better sense of smell? And you're all gonna say the dog. Well, it depends on what you mean by better, okay? Certainly a dog can, has got much lower threshold of detection. It can detect odors at much lower thresholds, but whether it can detect a wider range of odors, that's much more difficult to know. Um, and to give you some idea of quite the complexity of our nose, I'm gonna, and again, this, I'd have people up and we'd be doing this, but your nose, your brain really, can detect atomic differences, single atoms of carbon, or the orientation, the chiral orientation of a molecule. So normally I'd have people up on stage and they'd have two tubes, they would not know what they were, and one of them, caraway, would smell vaguely like curry, and the other, spearmint, would smell kind of like toothpaste. And people will be able to tell the difference apart. You, you can tell the difference apart, but if you think about it and you pay attention, you can also see this kind of similarities. I mean, as you can see from these uh, little diagrams, then clearly they are, they are uh, optical isomers. They're, ca uh, they're, they're chiral uh, isomers. They're exactly the same chemical structure, but in opposite orientations. And that different orientation is what we sense and what produces the difference of perception in our noses and our brains. Here's an, another example that I give. And people. I think only once in about 20 years has anybody ever identified these odors, and that was a molecular biologist who was using uh, octanol for an experiment. Um, so here we got two, uh, two alcohols, uh, seven carbon heptanol, which tastes violet, sweet, woody, and you add one carbon molecule, and now it smells sweet, so there's still an overlap, but orange, rose, so, for example, that um, uh, the uh, detergents that you might, washing up liquid that you might use, which uh, has, says it's orange scented, is in fact just got a load of octanol and nonanol, which is nine carbons long. So these two molecules, these two odors, you can give them to people 
and they can tell the difference. They can't define it because they don't have any words, but they can smell the difference. And that is down to a single atom of carbon. That raises a very striking thing about smell. What's the dimensionality of it? How do we measure it? We can measure uh, sound in intensity uh, and wavelength, and the same with light. Smell, there isn't an answer. As you can see from these examples, to describe a smell, we end up using words that describe other smells. There's no inherent measure that we currently have of what smells smell like. And this isn't just some kind of philosophical problem, it's revealing the profound difficulty that neuroscientists have had in understanding what on earth is going on. So I've kind of given you a hint that we've got an incredibly powerful nose. Dog does as well, of course. Um, so how many odors do you think you can smell? And again, normally I shout, I get people to shout out and they shout a number and it's kind of pitiful, like a million. And I go higher or lower and you know, we do, do this for a while. Anyway, I'm going to cut to the chase. OK, we don't know is the simple answer, but models suggest that we can smell, we can distinguish over one trillion odors. Now, clearly this is a model. Uh, nobody sat and smelt a trillion odors. That's not happened. Um, and when this paper was published, a lot of modelers, mathematicians got, oh, well, you don't understand anything about maths, to which, uh, which is probably true, to which the people who wrote the article said, well, you don't understand anything about smell, which was definitely true. So the simple answer is we don't know. There's no limit. It used to be said, oh, you can smell 20,000 uh, odors. I mean, that's just some random figure that appeared in the 1960s with no basis whatsoever. So basically, our sense of smell is infinite. And the dimensionality of it is also infinite and unknown. Just to give you one, one example. So if you extract uh, odor from the headspace uh, of a rose, you put an, a rose into uh, a chromatograph, a gas chromatograph, and you extract the odors from the headspace, there are about 250 different classes of molecule in that bouquet. Now, when we're smelling a rose, we're not necessarily smelling all 250 volatile molecules, but it does give you an idea of the complexity of the natural world, which isn't just composed of nonanol, octanol, heptanol, whatever. It's all of it is blends. So it is very, very complex world we live in. So now you're going to ask me, how does it work? And uh, to know how most things work, uh, you have to go back to the ancient Greeks because they pretty much figured it out. And so this character, Democritus or Democrates, if you prefer, so you can see he was living about two and a half thousand years ago. And he's the first atomist. I'm sure you've had him in your first year lectures and you've forgotten about him ever since, right? So Democrates realizes he's sitting there under his, uh, under his um, olive tree, drinking his retsina, looking at the Aegean Sea. And he goes, I think, because he's a philosopher, I think, that everything is made of atoms, this tiny little things that I can't even see. Okay, right, fine, brilliant, first atomist. But he goes further than that, he says, well, if the olive tree is made of atoms and the sea is made of atoms, then smells must be as well. And he says, well, basically, a nice smell has got a kind of round atom and a nasty acrid smell has got a kind of pointy one. And that's basically where we are. So there's some relationship, which we don't know, between molecular atomic structure and perception. How that works, we don't know. But that's the essence of it. And basically, we're stuck with thinking about it like Democrates uh, until uh, 1991, when these two people, Linda Buck and Richard Axel, discovered genes in rats that they hypothesized, they didn't prove, they hypothesized encoded the receptors that are actually doing the detecting. Uh, and they were absolutely right about and they went that and they went on to win the Nobel Prize in 2004 for that. So we've come an awful long way since Democrates. We've come a bit of a way since Buck and Axel, but we still don't really understand how these molecules work. So here's what we do know. This is your olfactory bulb. This is the base of your skull here, okay? You can see we're up here at eye level, like I said. 
So you've got your olfactory bulb, which is where the initial processing takes place. And then you've got these neurons, these sensory neurons that are dangling down into the uh, olfactory epithelium, the tiny little holes in your, in your skull called the cribiform plate. It goes down there and it's dangling down. Now, a significant point is that they are not in contact with the air. You do not smell odors in the air. None, nothing that you smell, are you directly smelling in the air. The reason for that is quite simple. Your neurons would shrivel up and die if they were in contact with the air. Instead, because basically you're a fish that lives on land, when we came out on land, we took the sea with us. So you've got all this snotty stuff, this mucous layer, which is protecting the cells. They're dangling down in there. The neurons are dangling down and the smells are then transported across the mucous layer into the, uh, and, and then bound with the receptors on the neurons. Now, these, most of the things we can smell are hydrophobic. So there are chaperone molecules, which people argue a lot about, and in art so much that they often don't show them on their figures, like on here, uh, called odorant binding proteins that have to bind to the smell molecules, take them at the surface of the, the, your, your, your mucus layer, take them through, take smells through the uh, mucus layer, and then release them, we think, so that they bind uh, with the neuron. So you can see that there are smell sensory neurons here. There's also this other stuff, which this figure hasn't mentioned, but we're now very interested in because this is where COVID gets in. COVID doesn't affect the uh, sensory neurons themselves. It affects these cells here, the sustentacular cells, and then either directly or indirectly causes inflammation damage uh, and then is eventually uh, able to get into your body. But this is the root. It's these little flesh colored cells here that are the root uh, of uh, COVID into our bodies. Now, you may notice that uh, these different neurons uh, are color coded. We've got red ones, green ones, and blue ones. And as you might suspect, the neurons aren't actually colored. Well, they are, but they're not colored red, green, and blue. What was discovered fairly quickly was that each neuron expresses just one kind of receptor molecule. So in a human, you've got 400, about 400 olfactory receptor genes. You've got two copies of each gene because you've got two chromosomes uh, of each kind of chromosome. So you have up to perhaps 800 because those two uh, alleles they're called, the two versions of the gene on each chromosome aren't identical. You've got up to 800 potential choices. And in ways we still don't, the developmental biologists are still struggling to understand. Each cell decides very on early in development, it will express just one of those 800 options. So each cell is expressing lots and lots of copies of 800, one of 800 uh, molecules. And each of these cells goes to the same place in the, olfactory bulb. It forms what's called the glomerulus, glomerulus which is kind of a, a staging post for amplification and also what's called lateral inhibition. These uh, glomeruli uh, can, can turn each other on and off. They can inhibit each other and so on. It's our initial processing. But the key point is each of these receptor molecules, uh, receptor neurons, expresses just one kind of receptor molecule and they all go to the same place in the brain. So the magic how do we get from 800 to a trillion? 800 neurons to a trillion receptors. Well, it's very simple. Each neuron, or each receptor molecule, can be activated by more than one smell. And each smell can activate more than one neuron. OK, so you've got a, what's called a combinatorial code at the periphery. So here's an example. Uh, this is completely made up, OK? You've got. 14 of, of, of your 800 potential receptors. And here we've got a load of alcohols. And here are the two I was talking about earlier on. Uh, and you can see that, uh, that heptanol is uh, activating um, receptor two and receptor five and receptor six. And uh, sorry, heptanol is doing that. And octanol is re activating receptor four, which heptanol does not. It's also activating receptor five and so on and so forth. So there's similarities and differences. And you can see that each receptor has got, uh, some of them got very broad ranges. They will respond to lots of different smells. Some of them are very, very specific. 
So as I say, this is this is completely made up, but I will show you some real data in a minute. OK, now to get back to they, uh, to Democrates, why is it that a particular receptor is binding to one molecule or to lots? Well, we don't know. OK, that is be very, very clear. We don't understand how these things work. Uh, human olfactory receptors or, or vertebrate olfactory receptors are called G protein coupled receptors, and they are very difficult to crystallize. We haven't yet been able to do that. So understanding how the molecule is actually oriented in, in three dimensions and how it changes its conformation as it binds with the, the stimulus molecule isn't yet known. Insects have similar but different structures. They're not deep GPCRs. They have recently uh, been crystallized. And so we are nearly, uh, we're getting very, very close to understanding how it works, but we still don't know. So yeah, how does it really work? And that is the answer. As I'm sure you've realized by now, uh, the answer to all good scientific questions is we don't know. Uh, so we really don't know how the sense of smell works, which is one reason why it's so fascinating. So the question then comes, how can we find out? And in terms of kind of research strategy, you need to decide what kind of system you're going to work on. So this is one possibility uh, that you can try and work out how the sense of smell works. When I was uh, beginning this research about 30, 40 years ago, I decided this probably wasn't for me. And instead, I chose this. And this is the maggot. This is not just the maggot, a maggot is the maggot. This is Drosophila melanogaster. You may remember this from your A-level biology if you did that. Tiny little fruit flies that have been the geneticist friend for over a hundred years. Okay, and this is, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these and why, uh, well, I've spent so long studying them. So this is that mysterious organism we saw uh, on the first picture of lots of noses. This is a very close up scanning electron micrograph of a maggot, it's a dead maggot covered in gold. That's how it works in an electron microscope. Uh, and these things here, Mark D, are not its eyes. Its eyes are just a clump of about 10 cells buried uh, deep in its body. These are its noses. It has two of them, one on either side. They're called the dorsal organ. You've got these taste organs, Mark T here. These aren't teeth, these things here. These are um, mouth hooks that it uses as it moves through the um, moves through the substrate, which is generally rotting peach, as we just saw. So to remind you, you've got four million smell cells grouped in 400 different types, each of which can have two versions. So that's 800 potential versions. OK, my maggots, that's pretty complicated. Right. And you could maybe sense a trillion smells. So that's another reason for maybe not starting with humans. So though we'll see that could be not right. A maggot, however, has just 21 smell cells and each one is different. Again, like us, each cell will express just one kind of receptor molecule. So you've got 21 smell cells, much, much, but the wiring diagram of how that then goes into the brain is basically the same as ours. So uh, this is what it looks like close up. This is the dome, as it's called. This is its nose, effectively. And you can see if you get really, really close up that it's got tiny little pores on it. This is on the, the ring around the side, side, but the same thing goes on here. And through those pores is where the smells go. Uh, and this is a, a drawing somebody did from, from about, ooh, about 50 years ago now, goodness me. And you can see that the 21 olfactory sensory neurons are grouped into seven bundles of three, and it's their branches, what are called the dendrites, that's the receiving bit of a neuron. Their dendritic branches are what form the dome. So what looks like an eye is in fact a whole network of membranes that are there simply to detect odors. Now, as I said, these aren't just any old uh, maggots, they're Drosophila maggots. This is a, a male Drosophila. You can tell by his back end and by these little things, they're called uh, sex combs, uh, which he uses for hanging onto the female when he's mating. So Drosophila is absolutely amazing, but it is very, very, very small. This is a USB key and that's Drosophila. <laughs> okay, so it's really tiny. Uh, and the maggots, of course, are the same size, a little bit smaller. So you've got something that, I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the dorsal organ, the nose is about 10 microns across. So the downside of this is it's really, really small. The cool side is you can, as you'll see, you can do all sorts of amazing things with it. Okay, so maggots, 
Well, that's basically what they do. <laughs> okay, they don't do much. They're highly genetically manipulable. You can turn genes on and off. They're always hungry. So they're always interested in the sense of smell. Uh, they are simple and they're also really, really dim. And, you know, unlike, you know, flies can move in three dimensions, clues in the name. They're also interested in things like sex. So they, they don't pay attention when you try to get them to smell because their mind's on something else. Maggots are really, they just want to eat. Like the hungry caterpillar, all they want to do is eat and eat and eat, get big and turn into a fly. And this is basic. Well, they can do a bit more. Yes, people have identified a few more behaviors, but there aren't very many. And this is uh, what it looks like. If you give them a smell here, you chuck a load of maggots. This is sped up quite a bit, the last five minutes normally. They're on an agar dish, so it's all nice and soft and wet. And they're all charging towards the smell, which is diffusing here. And this is arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily labeled smell, no smell, though clearly, in fact, this is actually diffusing. So there isn't a, a strict divide. But you can see very quickly, most of them have moved towards the smell. So you can very, very easily identify what smells they're interested in by counting the maggots on one side, the other side, and you make a little index. So it's dead easy to do behavioral experiments on. But the really interesting thing comes when you match, try and work out what's the link between the behavior and what's happening in those cells. Now, because this is Drosophila, we can do all sorts of cool things in it. Uh, we can make transgenic flies dead easy. And in this case, we are expressing green fluorescent protein, which comes from a jellyfish, and we're expressing it in only in the olfactory cells. So you can see here, this is the nose. And here we've got the cell bodies. These are the, the axons coming down here, going into the, the brain. So you've got all the, the cells, the neurons that are detecting the odor, uh, expressing GFP. Now, we can equally make a maggot with just one functioning smell cell in its nose. There's the dome again. And you can see just one cell is lit up with GFP, and that's because it's the only cell that works. So we can then record single cell activity. We can see what is that cell doing? How does it respond to smells? How are those receptors able to detect such a wide range of neurons, uh, of, of odors, and what do they do with that information? So this is our very high tech uh, setup. We got uh, a matchstick. Well, you know, stamp matchstick, you strap your maggot to it, you've got some parafilm, you've wrapped it around, the maggot's outlined in gray, in, uh, in yellow. We've got a recording, uh, a reference electrode, which I'm afraid is shoved into the maggot's backside. And then we've got the recording electrode here, which is going right down. You can see those little black mouth hooks here going into next, right next to one of those uh, cells that is the only cell that is active uh, in this maggot. And then you can blow an odor over it, record from it, and so on. And what this immediately shows us is that all my talk of activating, responding is inappropriate, right? So no, neuron, no, noses in particular and neurons in general are not switches, they are not computers, they're not binary, okay? They're not either on or off. Instead, they have an analog component and they can do lots of things. So here we got real, these are real data. Single cell, okay? So the cell, this is the black bar is when the, um, uh, the smell is put over it for one second. We've got two uh, different kinds of neurons here, one expressing the receptor 24A, the other receptor 74A, doesn't mind, matter why they've got those numbers, and they're being stimulated with butanol. And you can see that 24A uh, doesn't care. The fact they've got these, these spikes, a spontaneous activity, which all sensory neurons do all the time. They're just kind of ticking over. So what the brain is looking for is a change from spontaneous activity, okay? So there's nothing going on here. On the other hand, when you give uh, a maggot with, uh, uh, give OR74A butanol, it gets really excited. And you can see that stimulation is carrying on after the, uh, off, the off, uh, off point of the, the smell. On the other hand, we can give it octanol. This particular maggot, it's not the same maggot, was showing much higher levels of spontaneous activity, but you can see that in 24A, the cell is actually inhibited. So we haven't got zero and one, like in a binary system, we've got, okay, zero, one, and then minus one. Can you do that in binary? No. So there's something odd going on. This isn't binary. Uh, 74A likes octanol too, still showing very strong response. But sometimes the responses are mixture. We've got two heptanone here that, it, again, it inhibits the cell 
afterwards it goes as soon as it's got it's got one response to on and another response to off and then this uh, 74a is showing a double hump so there's differences in time the temporal sig the temporal structure of this signal is different from this one clearly yeah and the brain can see that so the brain is able to the, the neurons are responding in all this complicated way it's not just that they are responding like a tick like in the little model we had of how octanol and uh, heptanol were detected but even in that response there are a whole variety of very very rich neurobiological phenomena which the brain can detect so overall pretty much every as far as we know every smell stroke smell cell combination has a unique response and that's why things smell differently to you because different odors are producing these different patterns in your peripheral uh, sensory neurons and then in the first stages of activity that's all your perception is that's all it is is patterns of neuronal activity like this We've got changes from spontaneous activity, it can go up, it can go down. We've got intensity differences and changes over time. Now, how can we see if the smelling, the timing of that smell activity is actually significant? And one of the ways we started trying to do this is to make a maggot smell blue, which sounds kind of surreal, but what we can do, again, because this Drosophila is dead easy, you can put a photoreceptor molecule into a, an olfactory sensor neuron. So now you can activate that neuron by turning a light on. The, the maggot thinks it smells, okay? It's a bit like if you press your eyes, yeah, you see light. That's just because you're, active, you're activating your, uh, your, your retinal neurons by pressing them by pressure, but you perceive it as light. Same thing with the maggot. We flash a light on it, it thinks it's smelling something. Okay, this is blue light, the receptors are tuned to blue light. So we can then alter the structure because we can know exactly how uh, the cell is responding to different spikes, uh, different presentations of light. And it must be said, turning light on and off is a lot easier than blowing a smell over. We can control light a lot easier. So here's an example. Uh, we're going to see a maggot. Uh, there's a brief period uh, in which it's just moving around. There's nothing in the, in the dish. And then you're going to see two flashes of light and you'll see what the mouse, the, the maggot, the, ma the mouse the maggot does. OK, so we've got some fancy software uh, that's saying exactly what it's doing. It's orientation, two flashes of light. And you can see before it was just mooching about and now it's charging off. It smelt something. Even for that brief period, that's enough for it to say there's something going on over there. It thinks it's come from a direction and now it's charging off to uh, detect it. So what we can do to try and get at the temporal structure of the olfactory signal, here's an example. Each of these 200 millisecond pulses of light, these are real data, um, each produces between six to eight spikes. OK, so you can see that with a 200 millisecond interval between the two pulses, you've got a different temporal structure. You've got the same number of spikes, but a different temporal structure. OK, so if there's some uh, part of the brain which is, can detect that, then it would be able to tell the difference. If all the brain is doing is counting spikes, it wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these two pulses. OK, so this is our idea of trying to get at what's called temporal information, which a load of our studies using modelling have suggested is present in the olfactory signal in a maggot. And uh, we think the brain uses it. So I'm currently uh, awaiting. Uh, we wrote a grant, a grant on this. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Best thing I'd ever done. Uh, the panel didn't agree. So we're still waiting some money to develop this, unfortunately. OK, now. We're going to take a bit of a, a gear change from maggots to humans. Um, and uh, some of you have knows um, you may have been uh, on occasion tempted either on the Internet or on certain shops uh, that you can find where you can buy pheromones, uh, which allegedly uh, attract women fast. Androsterone, OK, uh, or attract men fast. So depending on who you're interested in, well, you can have the same stuff. So this is marketed as a sex pheromone. Um, it isn't what it was well, not a human sex pheromone. 
it's a boar sex pheromone. So this stuff, uh, if you're a pig farmer, uh, what, what happens is secreted by the, uh, the, the boar in his saliva and it will bring the sow on heat. OK, and then you can surprise it with a turkey baster and a little while later, you've got a load of piglets. So that's basically what farmers do. They con the sow into thinking she's going to mate with a, uh, a, a boar by spraying this stuff in her nose. So if you're ever tempted to uh, try this stuff, well, you might want to for reasons you're about to learn, but it's not going to have any effect. OK. So when uh, people are presented with this, and again, this would normally be something we do, um, we do on stage, we get a whole variety of responses. Some people say it smells, oh, that's quite interesting. Uh, so they clearly are people for whom this would work. Other people can't smell anything at all. Other people like me think it smells quite sweet. Uh, and then other people really don't like it. The most graphic uh, description I had was in fact from a, uh, a UCL student uh, in uh, evolutionary biology when I gave this talk a few years ago, who said it smelled like sweaty ball sacks. You also, this was when we were doing the public demonstration. So you should uh, think yourselves lucky if uh, that we haven't done that because you might have been that, that person. Now, what's interesting is that I know from her response and from my response, from everybody's response, I can tell you what your DNA is. Because in this particular instance, there is a very tight link between genome, genotype and phenotype, okay? So we, we know that here's a terrible snake diagram of the OR7D4 receptor. And we know there's huge variation in humans for this, which as indicates it's not a pheromone because a pheromone, you always want to get the same response. And there are two very significant uh, mutations or alterations uh, in the amino acid sequence. You can either have uh, arginine or tryptophan here, and you can have either threonine or methionine here. OK, and depending on which of those amino acids have that changes the binding with androsterone and it changes your perception. And this is unique because uh, this is the, one of the few exceptions to what I said earlier. Androsterone is only detected by OR7D4 and OR7D4 only responds to androsterone. So is that very tight link? And it's a single base pair changes. Uh, C to T in both changes. And if you have the R and the T versions, you think it's horrible. So sweaty ballsack girl, she thought it was R, she must have RT uh, in, her, uh, in her genome. I almost certainly am MW. Okay, so changes in perception are caused by changes in uh, structure of your receptor protein, which is determined by your DNA. So round about half of us, have, uh, sorry, each of us have, we got two copies of this receptor. And if you have two copies of WM, you generally think it's nice. If you got even one copy of WM, you're still more likely to think it's nice. And if both your alleles are RT, RT, you really didn't like it. Now, I'm gonna describe very briefly some work I've done with Kara Hoover in Alaska and Hiro Matsunami at uh, Duke University. First thing we did was to look at OR7D4 from around about 2000 indigenous populations all over the world. So these are uh, non-admixed peoples. They're not people like me who've got you know, DNA from all over the place, uh, rather they are from people who've lived in that area for a long time. You'll notice that there's two absences. Australia, so no Aboriginal people, and North America, so no Native Americans. And both these groups, very wisely perhaps, are very wary of uh, releasing their DNA and allowing it to be used in such studies. But the key point uh, you need to look at is that uh, green and red indicate it's horrible, okay? And blue, are uh, it's not so bad. And you can see straight away that the uh, ancestral form, the African form, because we all come from Africa, of course. So if you find a character in Africa, it's almost certainly the one we began with, yeah? So the ancestral form, you can see here, will have been, oh my God, it's disgusting. And something happened over time, which led these groups around in, in the Northern hemisphere to actually find it not so unpleasant. And one of our hypotheses, because when we look at the, the time scale for the appearance and spread of this uh, character, the not so bad character, uh, it seems to originate in Southeast Asia around about 5,000 years ago. And that is when, when and where humans started 
uh, domesticating pigs. And if you're a pig farmer, you have to castrate your male pigs, unless you want to breed from them. Because if they produce testosterone, if they produce androstenone, the meat smell tastes foul to many people. It's called boar taint. And, you know, people, a lot of people don't like eating it. So that's our hypothesis. We don't have any proof for it, but it's a hypothesis that this mutation, when it arose, allowed people to eat uh, male uh, pig meat. And this then leads to the final point I'm going to deal with. What about our cousins? And this was this was my idea. This is probably the only really good scientific idea I've had all on my own. I was out for a run one day thinking about the work, about this population distribution and the DNA and all everything else. And it, I stopped partly because I was lazy, but also because it just hit me like a thunderbolt. Well, look, look, what about Neanderthals? We've got the Neanderthal DNA. There are only 96 amino acid differences between genes encoded by Neanderthal and those encoded by us. So basically, we are the same, right? We interbred. I'm about 4% Neanderthal. Most of you will be perhaps a little bit less, perhaps a little bit more. So we can actually ask what the Neanderthals thought about it. How about that? We can look at their genome and say, what version of this gene did they have? How would they have responded if I wafted this under their nose? And it's not just the Neanderthals. How many people here have heard of the Denisovans? Now, sometimes you get a lot of shaking heads. I don't know. I could be very kind of caricature and say, well, you're a chemist, you don't know anything. Maybe you do. Okay, so the Denisovans, Neanderthals we've known about for about 150 years. Uh, the Denisovans were initially found uh, in 2009 uh, when this tooth, which if you look like me, it looks just like a tooth. If you know what you're talking about, it is a weird old tooth. It is whopping. Look, that's two, two centimeters across. It's a huge, great big molar. This was found out in Denisova Cave um, in, uh, in Siberia. And they didn't publish it. It's from about 40,000 years ago. And this cave had been occupied by humans and by Neanderthals, but this is not a tooth from either of those groups. So it, they, it wasn't published. And then in 2011, since they, sorry, they then discovered another tooth. They since discovered various other bits, a metacarpal, uh, which is um, a uh, finger bone, a baby tooth. And last year they found a bit of a skull and a jawbone. So we don't know what these people are. They're called the Denisovans because the cave was called Denisova Cave because a, a human hermit called Dennis used to live there. So sometimes called the Denisovans, Denisovans, call them what you like. But the bombshell happened in 2011 when they announced, they, in fact, they destroyed this finger bone. It's from a nine-year-old girl. They know it's from a girl because they got the DNA. Uh, they know she was nine because of the size it was. So something terrible had happened. She'd obviously died or she'd lost a finger. And they destroyed the bone to get at the DNA. And they discovered this completely new lineage of humans, which we had no idea uh, existed. OK, so this is what it basically looked like. We come out of Africa well, 70,000 years ago. We come into the Middle East. We bump into the Neanderthals. We, as they politely put it, we exchange genes with them. Um, and then uh, we're, they're also right way up here where I'm in Manchester. The Neanderthals were up here. We spread up here, probably bumped into them, mated with them. Same thing happened out in Denisova, uh, out in D Denisovan Cave and out here in the Far East, where modern human populations can have eight, nine percent of their DNA uh, was from Denisovan. So there was a lot of stuff going on back in the day. Uh, and this is a very accurate uh, model of <laughs> human evolution as to where we are uh, at the moment in understanding how it all happened. So they were all at it, basically. They all died out. We're still here, but we've still got their DNA in us. OK, so what did they think? What did they think, the Neanderthals and the Denisovan, think about androstenone, this particular uh, smell? Did they think it was sweaty ball sack? Or did they think it was, hmm, how you do it? So, firstly, we know the Neanderthals, all the Neanderthal genomes we've got, and there's about a dozen now, they were all RT. So they would have hated it. And that makes sense because I've already indicated that RT was the ancestral version. So humans, when we evolved, and then the Neanderthals left Africa uh, before we were Homo sapiens, they split off from our ancestors, uh, they will have all had RT. That makes that's exactly what we would have predicted from if, if it were any other character in any other animals. That wasn't a surprise. And then we got very excited because the Denisovans 
had a novel genetic variant in position 204 of the amino uh, of the gene, uh, A is turned into T. So we've never seen this before. Did it alter the response? So how can we find that out? Well, we recreated the Denisovan nose in a cell. Well, it's not quite that. Basically, what we did was to mutate a human gene and turn A into T at position 204, and then put that into a cell line and then express the uh, receptor and poured a load of uh, androstenone all over it. So at this point, I think basically we're in, um, this is like Schrodinger's uh, nose experiment, either, depending on what happens, this is amazing. We found out something astonishing or we haven't. So what happens when you do the experiment? Well, not a lot, sadly. <laughs> So what it showed is that it wasn't different from the, uh, this, the orange one here is the response. This is a dose response curve of androstenone with, it's all to do with uh, luciferase activity in the cell line. And basically the, uh, the RT version and the Neanderthal, the Denison version are no different. So it didn't work. Now we're pursuing this. We're looking at some other uh, receptors that have not just one odor that binds with them, but a small number. And we found, for example, uh, probably that um, the uh, Neanderthals probably like the smell of farts and Denisovans probably quite like the smell of honey. So maybe this is giving us some insight into their uh, sensory world. Oh, and we're certainly doing that, but maybe it's telling something about their ecology. So I find this quite amazing that simply from looking at a DNA sequence, we know something about how these long extinct individuals perceive the world. So here's the summary we got there in the end. We still don't understand how smell works. The way that we interpret smells is unbelievably complicated. We know from uh, the, uh, the current situation that the loss of olfaction has a massive effect on quality of life. And as I'll mention in a minute, it can something can be done about that. Uh, and we also have these amazing possibilities of looking into the deep past of sensory, the sensory world of extinct uh, humans. And of course, as in all science, knowing stuff is great, but it's what we don't know that's really interesting. Now, if you want to know more, um, there's this very short introduction. If you know these books, they're fantastic. Well, this one's particularly fantastic. Um, so this, we were even able to update it with a little bit about COVID as well. Um, and Adam Rutherford, science journalist, is very childish. Uh, and for, if any of you in your family or yourself have lost your sense of smell, either through COVID or through accident, if you've never had a sense of smell, if you genetically have no sense of smell, and there are a number of people who have such problems, there's probably not a great deal we can do. But if you've lost your sense of smell through injury or disease, I really would urge you to uh, contact these two organizations, fifthsense.org UK, which is the UK's smell and taste charity based at Imperial College, and absent.org. And both these groups, absent does a lot of what's called smell training to help people recover some kind of smell, sense of smell. Uh, and both these organizations have clearly gone from being quite niche uh, two and a half years ago to now being extremely important for many, many people uh, around the world because of the terrible effects of the pandemic. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an incredible talk. I really appreciate how, you know, it's something that we don't really think about a lot, but it's so important. So do we have any questions either in the theater or on Zoom? Okay, I guess I'll go first. So what drew you towards this field of research? Um, well, I was interested in pheromones. I was studying Drosophila. I mean, I've, I've been studying Drosophila for about 45 years now. Um, and I was in France. I was a postdoc and uh, I was going to apply for a job uh, with the CNRS, which is a bit like the MRC. Um, you know, it's a big research organization and we needed a project. We needed a project that, you know, I could really claim was going to be my own. Uh, and this was in 1988, so goodness me, a long time ago. Uh, and we decided that I've been working on pheromones and sexual behavior in, in, in adults. And we decided that smell, because 
the, the receptors had still not been discovered. In fact, it wasn't until the turn of the century that the Drosophila olfactory receptors were discovered. So that was still kind of 14 years in the future. Uh, we decided that understanding the sense of smell would be, uh, was going to be the big challenge. And I really didn't want to do it. There's a lesson here, which I tell my students. I really didn't want to do this because I said maggots are boring, right? Uh, my boss at the time, who was a bit of a bully, said, I don't care, you've got to do it. I said, no, I'm not going to. I want to work on flies. They're interesting. And he said, OK, well, look, just do me a favour. Just do one experiment. So I did the little experiment I've shown you, speed it up with the maggots moving, not the, uh, not the one with the optogenetics, the fancy blue light business. Just got a load of maggots, put them in the middle of a tray, put some smell on it, put the lid on and watch them for five minutes. And they all moved towards it. And I came out of the, the lab and I went to see my boss and said, right, we're doing that. Because when you study adult flies, you've got a pair of flies and you're trying to get them to mate and they don't always fancy it. The weather's not right. They've got a headache. They're thinking about something else. It's really, really frustrating. Maggots, fantastic. So that taught me an important lesson. Concentrate on what, you're, what you really need to know. And especially if you're dealing with animals, try and limit their choices. So maggots can't think about sex or anything else. They just think about food. That's what we wanted. There you go. And I got the job as well. Well, it's a great lesson that maggots have a lot to teach us. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Any other questions? Question in the chat or there's something in the chat? <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe I have a question. Do you hear me, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So basically you mentioned that we can smell something like, uh, I don't know the number. A lot. A lot. 10, 10 to the power of 12 uh, smells. Yeah, maybe it's 10 to the power of six. I don't know, a lot. I, but it was 10 to the power of 12, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the number. Yeah. According to the smell cells. So you said we have 400 smell cells and uh, we have like two subtypes, but let's kind of like ignore the subtypes for okay. this moment. And each smell cell is at least binary. And so this actually allows this kind of like at least binary because you've yeah. kind of like mentioned like some of them are tertiary and it's not so easy yeah. and it's not that nicely and linear as I'm describing. But when we actually do the combinatorics and when we uh, like consider each combination, we actually get a number with exponent of 120. <laughs> yeah, and that's so because, yeah. <laughs> Because we have a number n to power of 400, which is n is bigger than two, so. Indeed. So it's a, it's a very big number. I mean, but the, the point is that um, there will be some things that uh, are never, some combinations of neuron will never be activated. So uh, in fact, that's what, ha you know, because there's no structure that could combine could activate them all or inhibit them or whatever. That's just not possible. So the combinator the combinatorics, as you say, is, is quite devastating. Uh, and but that's not quite, it's not quite as simple as that in how it works. And in fact, we can see that some of you may have had COVID and started smelling things that were weird that you couldn't describe, or you maybe you could describe. Sometimes it's very, very un, uh, un, un, unpleasant. And you smell, fe people smell feces, for example, all the time, it's horrible. Um, I have a very mild version of that. If I have a cold, I have mild sinusitis and I can smell what I can only describe as weird toast. It's not actually a smell of toast, but it's a bit like that. So what's happening is that the virus, whether it's COVID or whatever, is affecting a subset of neurons and is then making them in a, unable to fire or making them fire in an erroneous situation. It's a bit like playing a keyboard. If you've got a keyboard uh, with a piano and you play it, you've got a lovely chord. And if you imagine just taking out some of the black notes or the white notes or connecting them to a different string, all of a sudden it smell, sounds discordant. So the, this mixture of um, a set of uh, odors that are activating a small, probably only, no odor is going to activate, you know, all 400 uh, types. It'll only activate a dozen or so, maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, even then, you've got this possibility of, through damage or infection, uh, you're getting changes to your perception. As I say, it can be, uh, some people find this very distressing. They found it through taste. So you may have seen, there's lots of articles about this now. Three years ago, nobody was interested in it. 
Uh, but for example, you know, people who say, well, you know, coffee now tastes like tar. I can't drink it. It's horrible. And that's because their olfactory receptors have been damaged and they're getting this scrambled input into their brain, which is then being misinterpreted. Thank you for the answer. Like <laughs> the, the, the thing I kind of like see from this, that this is an extremely complex problem. Yeah. <laughs> Chemistry is much simpler. It's also magic in my view, but... Uh, <laughs> scaling up makes things extremely difficult. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We have a question from the audience, but the person asking has to arrive. <laughs> okay, no problem. It's on. Um, hey, can you, can, is that fine? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, I can uh, hear. yeah so basically I've got two questions. One of them is, what do you think about how during COVID they said, if you lose your like sense of smell, you could take like vitamin A to get it back. Like, what do you think of like the relationship between like vitamins and like trying to, you know, like how would that work anyway? Kind of thing. Um, right, yeah, I didn't know, I don't know the vitamin A thing. I remember everybody, we were all very uh, keen on vitamin D for a long time, and I was dosed up to the eyeballs with it because my wife insisted we all had to have it every day, which wasn't going to do me any harm. I thought it would piss it out in the end anyway, which is probably what happened. Uh, and then vitamin D kind of went away. Um, so the, the short answer is because we don't understand how it works, it's very hard to, there's no evidence, I would, short, very short answer, there's no evidence for that. The only there seem to be two ways of getting your smell back. Either you, it's simply time and your, so those neurons are stem cells, right? That means they can turn into anything. So those, that's the only part of your brain which is continually regrowing throughout life. Now it declines with age, which is why old people, if you go and see uh, your grandparent in, uh, they'll probably say food doesn't taste of much anymore. And that's because they can't smell much. And so the food is limited to those four or five basic sensory modalities of taste. It hasn't got any flavor. So time will sometimes enable those cells to regrow. But then just think about it. Those cells have not just got to regrow. They've got to find the right place. And you're not, you're not a growing, you know, you're not an embryo anymore. So they've got to wiggle their way through and find their way to the right part of the brain. So it's quite tricky. We don't really understand if and how that happens. So time can get over it and it may be that you've had terrible inflammation and that goes down and yeah. the remaining cells even if they haven't been damaged can still um, respond the other thing you can do is what's called smell training as i said that's what absent does and basically it involves repeatedly over a period of a month or so smelling very very strong odors that you can still smell and gradually a bit like just learning to to, to, to smell again, you know, paying attention to very, very faint stimuli uh, that you may have, but it's not a guarantee. And the, 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 the you know, if you go you know, three years ago, if you went to see a doctor, you said, I'll often a sense of smell, I've fallen over, bang the head, because that can happen. The nerves simply get sliced by that cribiform plate by a sudden jerk. Head injury can often lead to loss of sense of smell. The doctor would say, well, there's nothing I can do, go away. Um, and sometimes, sadly, that is the case. Um, and that's one of the effects of, of long COVID, people with no sense of smell or scrambled sense of smell, which is not just about flavor, you know, leaving the gas on. Uh, they put an odor called mercaptan into gas so it smells, so we can really smell it. it smells of death, actually. Uh, vultures are attracted to it when there's a, a leak in a pipeline. Um, but we wake up and we'll smell that. But if you don't have a sense of smell, you can't smell it. So it, it is a, it's a massive issue and we'll, it's going to, get bigger right anyway sorry you had another question yeah. oh no I was just going to say firstly that that's quite interesting that you say that because actually when I had COVID um <laughs> I was really sad because I couldn't taste anything and I couldn't smell yeah. anything and I actually <laughs> I sounded like a crazy person but I literally was there like breathing like an onion and being like this is an onion <laughs> and, <laughs> and I would like cry because of the onion smell but I wouldn't smell it and then I'd be like oh this is so annoying but actually what got it back for me pretty quickly was eating chilies I know this sounds really weird but like actually like kind of you know like testing my I don't know I guess my taste buds but also like because it's all connected actually just kind of 
activated but I think because I, I tried everything because I was so sad um, because I tried vitamin A as well but I think that was just a placebo kind of vibe but yeah, I definitely right. did do the training thing yeah. so from so my that, side in, you did that well. inadvertently um, and that's good that's good you did the right thing and I think what you said is absolutely right it is miserable you know <laughs> especially for young people or I don't you know you can't you can't smell your loved one. You, I mean, people, we, people think that smell doesn't count very much. It counts an incredible amount. It's so important in our lives. And when people lose it, uh, you know, if you've got a baby, what's the, the best smell in the world is the back of a baby's neck. And now you can't smell your, your child anymore. Uh, and so these are, are really significant issues. As to the chilies, it might have worked, but I'll simply note that you, you, you had no control. <laughs> So there's time was passing as well. So it may have been it would have happened every anyway. But um, I, you know, it doesn't matter because you got it back, which is the main thing. And yeah, anybody yeah. who's lost it, give chilies a go. You never know. <laughs> yeah. And also my just my second question was um, how you were saying kind of like there's no sort of um, classification for yeah. odors kind of thing. So, for example, like you just say, oh, this smells orangey or whatever. Um, I just wanted to ask is, for example, things that you would classify as orangey, are they connecting to the same receptor? Don't know. Or, oh. Don't know. Don't know. No idea. So, part of the problem is we've got very limited idea. Um, because we can't do experiments on humans, we can't do my maggot experiments on humans, yeah? Um, we don't know what most of those receptors are responding to. And when we express them in cell lines, they, that is a very weird situation. They don't have those odorant binding proteins I talked about, which people tend to forget about. Uh, and they may well be significant in how neurons respond. Indeed, they're not actually expressed in neurons at all. They're expressed in cells. You know, I don't know, they're liver cells or something. I don't know what. So. There's a whole set of stuff that isn't quite right, but even so, um, but we what we find is that different receptors will respond. Some of them will respond to dozens and dozens and dozens uh, of odors. And in uh, a, a decent experiment, you may have some groups will study four or five hundred odors on a range of different receptors. So you generate vast amounts of data. Uh, it's very difficult to know is is that the limit? You know, given there are effectively an infinite number of odors out there potentially, the mind ones we can detect or not. Um, so it, 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 it's very hard to know. People have tried to do this and they're currently uh, using AI, as you might expect, to try and find the patterns because they're gonna, you know, it is, it can be done. There is coherence to it. Uh, the other way of doing it is by mutating, for example, the OR7D4 receptor that we have and seeing, we now kind of understand where the, molecule binds to the receptor, the smell molecule and androstenone binds to the receptor. So in fact, my idea of saying I didn't want to work on humans was daft because we couldn't do anything. In one case, we've actually got insight into structure and function through this weird uh, chance that one, which probably indicates that way, way back in our evolutionary past, it was a sex pheromone or a pheromone receptor of some kind, uh, but hasn't been for millions of years. Uh, there is this link between one odor and one receptor. So we, that's been mutated at different points and people are trying to predict how the receptor will change its conformation and then try and guess, because it is then guessing what the neuron will do. Because how the neuron is actually changing the activity of the neuron, the, the receptor is changing the activity of the neuron is another big kind of issue in sensory biology in general, not just in, uh, in uh, olfaction. Cool. Yeah, because I was just gonna say like you could, if obviously finding this out in the future maybe if if it's actually you know if you actually find it out you could just name instead of saying orangey you could name it with the like yeah. well clearly you can classify i mean you're you lot are much better than if your organic chemistry is good you can you will have a classification of them or you know benzene rings and all the rest of it and they have similar kind of aspects but part of the problem is that some odors that we smell we don't smell so for example, benzaldehyde. Benzaldehyde is present in the environment. You've probably used it in your organic chemistry labs and it smells to us, but we're not actually smelling benzaldehyde. We know this from experiments on mice. We have an enzyme in that mucus layer, which it chops it up because benzaldehyde is really nasty, which chops it up. And so we are in fact, we can smell the acid or the aldehyde part of the molecule. We can't smell the whole thing. 
So our perception is being filtered even before the neuron gets to attach, gets to bind to the, uh, the smell. There's stuff going on at what is topologically speaking outside our body, bodies. Interesting. Well, thank you for answering my two questions. You're very Thanks. welcome. Do we have any other questions? We actually have another question from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, okay, good. Uh, Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, when you showed those videos of those maggots moving across the Petri dish and about the beetle that flies through the woods, yeah. uh, how, do, how do these animals kind of assign directionality to smells? Is there anything beyond just uh, monitoring changes in, in intensity as they move? Or? Yeah, that's it. Well, it's not only changes in intensity. Clearly, there's an odor gradient. You know, if you take a, a step, if you're a maggot, it's not really a step, a lurch forward, yeah? Oh, it's now more intense, or it's more intense over there. You can see them wiggling their heads around. And so even the tiny little gap, which is about, I don't know, 60 microns between their little noses, we people have studied and shown that there is a difference in the activity of those of the cells on those two sides as an odor is blown over. So they can tell where by the difference in the in the 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 the, the timing of the signal, there'll be a you know, I don't know, a few milliseconds difference in signal A, signal B, right, left, but also in the intensity and the shape of the activity as the smell moves over it. So it's both ways, both by moving and getting, and then having, they must have some kind of loop. They can compare current with immediate past. Okay, that's more or less. I'll go the other way if I don't like it, or I'll go towards it if I do like it. But also, as I said, left, right, uh, hemispheric difference. People have even done terrible experiments and made maggots with just one smell cell, not when I said only one cell, it's, I really meant two. Uh, so you can then see the behavior, a poor old maggot that's kind of limping along. It can still smell, but it, it has a hard time precisely finding where the odors are coming from. So it's kind of like how uh, we use our ears to well, it's how you lose your, how, how you use your smells. You got a cat, you got a cat flap in your house and a male tomcat comes in your house, you know about it because the bug has sprayed somewhere. The only way to find where it is to clean it up is to, you know, sniff around. Then eventually you find it and you can clean it up. Or if you're, you're walking past a, a restaurant or some food place and you can smell it, then, you know, you will uh, track it. People have actually done experiments on students with this in California. They put a kind of chocolate odor down on the grass and uh, put masks uh, over the students' eyes and you know, ear can sound cancelling headphones and made them track the, uh, the smells. Got a paper in nature out of it. Um, and the, the students behaved just like, uh, uh, just like um, bloodhounds. They did a zigzag track. You know, they, they found it, they moved on. It's not there anymore. So they, they turned around and went back. Moths do exactly the same thing. That's how the male moth zeroes in on his, uh, on his uh, on his lover. Sure. Uh, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? We all done? It's getting on. Thanks. <laughs> you can all go to the pub. I think if we were in person, we'd love to invite you for maybe a pizza uh, or a drink. That'd be very nice. Um, Next time, eh? Next time. Yeah. But thank you so much for having a talk today. Um, we really appreciate it. And I, I'm sure I speak for everyone there, so it was really engaging. So thank you so you're very, much. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. stay safe, everybody. Keep on wearing their masks. That's my view anyway. Okay, see you.